Hi, I'm Ed Weber. Um, I have a dairy farm on, in Bovina on the upper end of town. Uh, we milk about 50 head of cows. I have 35 head of beef animals. I'm Jack Burns. Uh, live on Bramley Mountain Road. Been here since 1960. Uh, grew up in Bovina. My ancestors settled here in Bovina in 1800. Uh, I'm Thomas Burns, and this is my wife, Joan. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Donna Weber. I live in Bovina Center on Crescent Valley Road. Uh, my name is Dominic Gullo. Uh, I'm 38 years old, and I've um, been here in Bovina now for just about 18 years. Well, my name is Tom Hilson. Uh, I started farming uh, the same year I got married. Uh, I took over the farm here in 1977. We've lived here all my life. I was born here and uh, my wife and I, Donna, uh, we bought the farm in 1976. And at that time there was, uh, I believe, 38 farms in Bovina. And right now, presently, there's four. It, it used to be uh, daring was a way of life. You, and you, you kind of was born into it and uh, the money end of it seemed to take care of itself as long as your animals were healthy and uh, you had decent uh, milk markets and this type of thing. But as time has gone and it has gone by, uh, uh, farming has become much more competitive. Of course, these smaller farms like mine, which was, as I say, I had 40, a little over 40 cows. Um, it became very, uh, um, oh, you had to be very good managers, and so just being born on a farm wasn't enough. Oh, our family's always been farmers. Uh, we bought this place, my wife and I, when we got married, and then a few years later, my brother and I decided to form a partnership and build a new barn for 150 cows. Uh, which we did, moved into that in 1968, and uh, it's still there. Dominic Gallo now operates that farm. We grew up farming. I remember as a kid, <coughs> uh, we used to go out and with a pitchfork and shake the hay out when it got rained on, so that it would dry. And uh, in the springtime, we used to go out and pull mustard weeds out of the hay fields. Uh, we, when we were eight, nine years old, we used to go and round up the cows for milking. When I was growing up, I grew up down in the village after my grandfather Parsons died and the whole town, that the whole town was farmers or someone that did business with the farmers. They either worked for the farmers or they owned one of the stores or the feed store, worked for the feed store. The town was very self-sufficient. Very few people ever went out of the village to work. They all stayed right in the village and worked. And when my sister and I were little, we would be at the playground and Les Roy would go by with his team of horses with the manure spreader on the back to spread his manure every day. And that's like a blasting memory in my mind. And my sister and I used to sit on the porch and visit with him. And it was, a, it was a much tighter community than it is now. Well, one of the big things I believe that really hurt, uh, well, I'm going to say put an end, the final, put the final nail in the coffin, uh, was two things down here in Bovina. When, when the creamery closed up, stopped taking canned milk, and smaller farms here that didn't want to go to the expense of putting in a bulk tank, they had to go out of business. Uh, the other one was when Hilton Brothers feed store closed. Farmers back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s milked the cows by hands. Milk went into cans. They took their four or five cans down to the local creamery, and most of these smaller communities had them. Bovina had their own uh, little creamery. And uh, when the bulk tank and refrigeration came into be, basically put all these local small creameries out and you started moving all this to bigger and bigger processors and yeah I, it's it's a good life but I mean if you're not if you're not willing to put the uh, time effort 
into it and and not and the financial rewards is when you get them it's great but uh they're not they're very few and far between uh it's a tough life to i can make more money elsewhere a lot easier than, than working on a dairy farm and running it but uh it's, it's still a good life and uh, if somebody really has got the heart to get into it and do it you know more power to them but it's a long road to hoe the biggest thing is to find somebody to go in there and milk them cows because who likes to work actually 24 hours a day well actually yeah you're actually working 24 hours a day because it's, it's on your mind whether you're doing it or not you, you sleep with it you eat with it you work with it. Mm -hmm. this is the way it is you learn as you go along um, there's really nothing you know you can go through all the college and textbook thing that you want but uh, there's no substitute I don't feel for experience and actually getting out and doing it and that's generally how I feel I uh, learn the vast majority of what needs to be done it's a business where everything's constantly changing so you know what you learn today might not work tomorrow the cows have to be milked twice a day seven days a week and uh, it's uh, someone has to be there to do that you can't just not milk them uh, like uh, if there's a desk job uh, in town someplace uh, you work all day and there's still work left to be done you can sit there until you come back the next day where on a farm the work has to be done every day and it has to be completely done every day you have to be kind of a jack of all trades uh, I happen to have some you know uh, uh, well I have the automotive experience behind me as far as uh, machine repair and stuff like that so I do almost all of them. If you don't have the right mindset as a couple um, to understand how, how much it takes to make a living in the barn and if you're fighting it all the time where uh, if I had fought Thomas all the time to be down here at dinner you know at such and such a time to be with the kids that we had to take a vacation we had to do this we had to do that have that normal almost suburban family life the tradition it don't happen it doesn't happen on a farm it's not a job it's a way of life you have to be dedicated to it. you have to love it or you'll be miserable your whole life well it is a lifestyle choice um, you know I've always said when you own your own business to a point, the business is your life. There's days that can go on for 16, 17 hour days, and then there's days we might take it easy, like on Sundays, and just do the bare minimum and put in four or five hours. But uh, the unfortunate thing with this occupation is it's seven days a week, and you've got to pretty much enjoy what you're doing. And then again, you know, with most businesses, which you're really into it, tied into it, it's, it is a seven day thing. I think there's some people that bought a farm hoping to make it into like a little hobby farm and raise some beef and some chickens and um, I, I know some people that have tried it and it came disillusioned when their chickens got eaten by the raccoons. And, you know, it's not as easy. You can't really be a part-time farmer. You really have to be a full-time farmer to make it work. Our children growing up in a society where it was not uh, a dairying society anymore. They're, they really, the kids that they went to school with, very few of them came from dairying families. Mm -hmm. So they didn't understand in some ways why does so-and-so always have daddy and mommy at the ball game? Or why do they always go away? Why do they always go to the <laughs> movies? I'm going, well, because they don't have to milk cows. I do chores in the morning. The kids don't, um, they stay in bed, especially during the school year. They don't have to do anything in the morning. Um, so I come out about 6 o'clock and then I go back in at 7 and get the kids up and off to school and then I'm back out at 8. And in the winter time, I can go to work around 11, work all day, and then I come home and help the kids at night with chores. Your, your biggest wear on anybody's body and mine, because you have to be in that barn twice, a day, seven days a week, and you can't really hire anybody to do this. The milk they produced, some years uh, you made a profit and some years you didn't. And, uh, you went through periods when, when uh, milk was decently priced, 
but then other things, expenses started to creep up and uh, profits got less and uh, there were big cycles in that. And uh, as late as the 1990s, uh, I'll bet uh, we didn't make a profit only two, uh, two years out of the 1990s. It was really tough and I think that's when farming really went on the decline. Our product has to be out there every other day. It has to be on the truck and gone. We, ca we can't store it. We can't do anything with it uh, except ship it. Some farmers are trying cheese, which is fine. Um, you know, that that's, probably works out good. I don't know. Uh, but our product is perishable. We cannot wait. Well, basically, we make the milk. It goes into a bulk tank. A milk truck from uh, the co-op or company that we ship our milk to comes every other day picks the milk up we are paid on a hundred weight basis uh, for simplicity about 10 pounds in a gallon of milk so we're getting paid for every 10 gallons um, the price that we receive is basically dictated by the federal government and state governments and various other pricing of milk is an extremely complicated uh, thing I haven't quite figured it out hundred percent I'm not sure there's too many people that have we have no control of what we get for our milk and there's not many industries can say that government USDA uh, looks at cheese prices, looks at uh, production, uh, looks at consumption, and the areas, there's area federal market order areas, uh, northeast and southeast and west and midwest and all that, they all have formulas for those areas and uh, that's, and they figure it out. We don't know until after the fact. We don't have anything to say on how much we get that's that's how that's one of the things that's one of the problems of dairying we don't know what we're going to get from month to month um, biggest challenge business wise in this industry is the fact that we receive wholesale price for our product when it leaves the farm and yet all the products that we buy in and services we buy in we pay retail for um, because of that, it kind of makes it a little difficult and challenging in terms of a balancing act uh, to lead towards profitability. The more people who have their hands into it, obviously those people are going to pull something out of it. You have us, the producers, and you have the handlers, and you have the processors, and you have somebody else that handles it to take it to the, to the stores, and then you have the actual retailers and you know each one of those parties has to make some sort of a profit on to it and because of that because it is constantly in somebody else's hands uh, that tends to add the price up to it. We went organic in 97 um, is when we went through the transition and started shipping organically and that made a huge difference in our income simply because we were we had a, a price, we demanded a price. You had some control over what you were what getting you for your product. That was, that's one of the main reasons we went into it. And we uh, believe, we still believe, and I always believe that organics is definitely for your own purposes and for the purposes of the world in general. It's a more sensible way to do anything. Organic dairymen, they got out of their bib and tucker, they put on their three-piece suit and they said, excuse me, you want my product, I have something you want, you are going to pay me for it, and these are the rules under which you will receive it. Uh, I didn't want to sell the cows, but you know, you, you gotta wake up <laughs> and uh, realize what you can do, you know? I think, the, I think the, the generation, Ed and my age, just, they didn't want to be farmers. It's too much work, and there's not enough money, and they want to be able to, come and go as they please and not have to be tied to the farm from 7 in the morning to 9 at night with, without a break. Uh, there's no money in it. You work your butt off and what do you got when you get done? 
hip replacements, knee replacements. A lot of farmers got old, uh, and, you know, and, and you try to dairy farm it when you're, you get old and, and you, you know, your bones get a little tired, it, you have to do, do something. And a lot of them have retired. A lot of the uh, younger generations, uh, you know, there's jobs out there, it's a lot easier to do. So they just, they go to them and the farms get sold and uh, go to development or whatever. The land was sold because that was the, the highest value was sold off to folks looking for a second home. <laughs> and that's basically, unfortunately, what farming in, in this area has come to. How do you keep the wolves away from the door? And then once you're done dairying, what do you have left as an asset? Absolutely nothing other than your land. We've made a living in the sense that we were able to survive, but we don't have that American dream. Not that I want to go play golf or sit on the beach or anything. I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't working. You know what you do about sitting on the beach? <laughs> My wife and I are getting to the age now where, uh, you know, we got to look to the future and we can't work like we used to. Putting these long days in uh, really makes you think if it's really worth it to continue to uh, if we can't make a dollar at it. I don't think farming has got much of a future here. I think uh, you're going to see these farms finally uh, one by one when the men get old enough that they don't want to do it anymore, they want to retire, uh, those farms won't be picked up, they'll be just vacant. If you define farming only as dairy farming, mm -hmm. it's it's gone from here except for those individuals who are in it now and can maintain it or somebody coming in who yeah but who wants to do it coming who, in they have they, to, what, what do you do and how do you maintain the land that you have here and to me it, it takes farmers and people with land now to change what is the attraction what what would attract people to allow uh, and to my farm and to me, that means going diversified in the sense of agritourism. Maybe you are, and I know Thomas and I differ here, is more what he might consider hobby farms, where you have several different types of animals to satisfy those niche markets. You have lambs and you have goats to satisfy uh, the, the ethnic markets throughout the, throughout the nation and very heavily on the East Coast. Uh, it seems like to me there was a, a more cohesive sense of community than there is now. Most, most uh, young people that want to farm can't afford to buy anymore. The, the uh, land is being gobbled up by folks from the city. Actually the city itself is paying big bucks for farmland. And uh, you know, a farmer just can't afford to buy it. There's an opportunity for farming in Delaware County and in Bovina, but it, it takes people to to realize that it's it's not magic. You can't just put a seed in the ground or put a cow on the field and it's going to happen. No. It's a business, and you've got to have a market for it. You also have to have um, land prices or taxes that you can afford. And as land continually be, is sold to to homeowners who have a great sum of money. And they want to maintain and the, it, the and looks, the, and the, and the, as it is. And your taxes keep going up. How am I going to afford to pay the taxes on this? I would like there to be a future in Bovina for farms, but I don't know. I just don't see the... I see the new farmers, the new people that are coming in that would like to be farmers, but they're not going to be able to do it full time. They're just going to do it on weekends and have someone else do the work for them when they're not here. And, you know, it's just, it's getting very depressed. Farming's getting very depressed. And I just see so many people just wanting to get out of it now. A few people are coming in, but most, most people want to get out. I don't know. I, in 20 years, I don't know if there will be any dairy farms left in Bovina. People that come here because of the, like I said, because it's like coming to the Garden Eden. It just is not going to be here because this is what made it what it is, the, all these small farms. Well, there's a future for certain types of farming. Uh, the dairies that are left, uh, there's, there's lots of land available 
um, folks from the city who've, who've bought land like to see it used and uh, usually they don't charge very much rent and uh, so there is land available. Uh, the future of dairying, I'm not sure. I can't think of uh, a job personally that I would rather do. I like getting up every morning. I like going to the barn. I like, I could be in the barn all day, every day. I love the animals. Um, there's, there's so much future in farming. There's like such technology and they just know so much more than with like nutrition and just, there's so much more that's there out there to be offered to a person if they want to stay a farmer. The only thing that's missing is the price of milk. Uh, it's dictated to us by the government and we just can never seem to, to get to the point where we make enough milk or enough money from our milk to pay for our bills and still have something left over. I suppose that's what farmers have said for centuries, but I see that as the downfall. I, I miss farming, I'll be honest with you. I, the, the job I have now is pretty much bureaucratic. It's, uh, it, I, well, I like the people I work with, don't get me wrong. I miss farming, I've, I've missed it from the day I sold my cows. You know, whether the three of us are all last generation, that remains to be seen, but uh, I guess time will tell on that one.